The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. And you're going to love it. Okay, let's go. You know, I, I seriously, I think I'm going to have to start wearing a tie and a suit. You, 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 you look like a million bucks. <laughs> it's the dinero respectability. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, listen, today is a, today is a treat for everybody, but it's especially a treat for me because I have found somebody to talk about a topic that quite frankly, I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. And, you know, I've just been kind of trying to do the research and understand it. And so we are blessed today to have Professor Demetrius Flautus. And I am going to lay this out for everybody. And I, I do want to read a little bit of your background, if that's okay, because I want everybody to realize, you know, what a distinct honor it is to have someone with your expertise. So Professor Flautus is an adjunct professor at the law facility of Emmanuel Kant Baltic Federal University in Kaliningrad. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Okay, fantastic. He's a practicing international lawyer and a regulatory advisor who's lived and worked in Russia and Ukraine for over a decade. Among others, he served as team leader for the Russian accession to the World Trade Organization project. In addition, Professor Flautus has provided commentary on matters of foreign affairs and international relations to a number of international think tanks with his views frequently appearing in the media worldwide, BBC TV and radio, Voice of America, Financial Times, Daily Telegraph, Washington Post, Politico, and others. All the places that hopefully I'll get on at some point. But anyway, listen, Professor, it is it is a pleasure to have you because I've been searching for really what, what I consider an expert to help us understand, you know, what is going on in this situation with Russia in Ukraine and to help us understand, you know, is this something that, you know, just started in March of 2022 or is there much more to the backstory? And if so, you seem to be the guy to help us understand that. So, hey, welcome to welcome to the Deep Shallow Dive. My pleasure to be in Deep Shallow Dive, and I hope that this is going to be of interest to your viewers and listeners. Absolutely. To answer your question, this is going to go a bit far, but not as far as Vladimir Putin did in his Tucker Carlson interview, where he actually went all the way back to the Middle Ages. Yeah. I am go I'm going to go... Um, you know, to a much more recent period, and that's going to be the 20th century. We can start it from here. Until the First World War, we have to remember that Ukraine, the current state of Ukraine, was divided in two. Western Ukraine was part of Austria-Hungary, and Eastern Ukraine was part of the terrorist Russian Empire. You already st this. You already see how the seeds of this division start being planted because uh, the people who consider themselves Ukrainian today, uh, one hundred years ago, they were part of two different countries that actually went to war in the First World War, and they were belligerents against each other. Ukraine had never been an an independent state, with the exception of a brief statehood during the Russian Civil War. And that was after the First World War that we are talking about. So we need to know these things in order to appreciate and evaluate why is it that uh, the Russians, Putin, for instance, why is it that they think so little of Ukraine as a real state? So it has always been, to some extent, partly at least, a part of the Russian sphere of influence. And let's move now to the Second World War. 
Let me ask you a couple questions on that. So to summarize that, so are you saying that, you know, back even a hundred years ago, fundamentally, the Russians have always considered Ukraine part of Russia? And then did half of Ukraine consider themselves Russian? Yes, this is quite true. And this was this goes obviously much longer before, but as we said, we are not going to delve so far into the past yeah. because we would need first of all it's rather murky and number two we need three podcasts to make sense of yeah exactly let me ask you one more question the tucker carlson interview of vladimir putin what did you think about it overall i thought that this was the a very interesting expose of the russian sides of things and very important for uh, for us, for the West, to understand a little bit what is going on in their minds and what is it that they're thinking. The majority of uh, the interview, as far as I could evaluate, was actually honest, direct, and truthful. There were there was an, there were a number of points, and these have been well pointed out by pundits since that were uh, let's say of questionable uh, verification, and a couple were fabrications even. But then, for someone, if you were wanted to present what the Russian establishment really feels about the Ukraine war. I think this was a very good introduction and the only one that has happened since the war began for us. No, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, my thought press, uh, my thought process on it was, you know, why would you not want to hear from Vladimir Putin? Here's a guy that collectively the United States and NATO countries are saying is the enemy. We've sent over, you know, $175 billion. Now here's a chance for him to Tell us what's going on from his point of view. You know, I, I thought it was ridiculous that the Western media criticized Tucker Carlson for doing it when when fundamentally I looked at it as, hey, it's just a, it's just another data set. Let's take it in. And 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 I think you 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 summed it up perfectly. Okay. Absolutely. Too. And may I add, we in the West, we wave the banner of free speech and giving everyone, even the enemy, if it comes to that, a, an opportunity to be heard. And then Tucker Carlson, as you very correctly said, he was criticized for doing exactly that. I mean, shouldn't we at least be the first to listen to what we, are, we believe are our main principles and values? Absolutely, absolutely. All right. So so where should we start now? Should we go to 2012? Should we go back to the 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 ending of the Cold War? I took I took some notes and I'll tell you what was interesting is you are one of the very few people that seem to have actually predicted this war. Yes, this is correct. I am afraid that I predicted this and I wish that I had been wrong, because this is a terrible tragedy for everyone concerned, particularly for Ukraine more than anyone else. And I and Ukraine is a wonderful place with warm and brave people, and I'm extremely sad that it happened. But yes, I had already foreseen it uh, at around 2010. But mm. Let me continue our little historical uh, excursus by going to where we just stopped, which is the 1930s and essentially the Second World War. By the end of uh, by the end of the First World War, and after, as we said, Ukraine had become briefly, for the first time ever, an independent state. There had never been something like that. The, the Soviets actually took over the whole of Ukraine, which means that they reached the borders of what we knew as USSR uh, until 1991. And, of course, the, 
they reached the borders of what is now included in the sovereign state of Ukraine. So after 1922, think about this, this whole Ukraine thing, entity, was a part of the Soviet Socialist Republics. And however, as I had said, there had already been bad blood between the Russian speakers and the Russians in general and the Western Ukrainians, who are the ones who speak Ukrainian language at home, as opposed to the Eastern Ukrainians, who, until the war at least, were speaking Russian at home. So what are the languages? Are the languages tremendously different? Can Russians understand Ukrainian? And yeah, can Ukrainian they understand can. Russian? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, they are. They're very similar. Okay. In and what's what happened then in the war was uh, catalytic to what was to to happen afterwards. Okay. Okay. So it's almost like Ukraine is always, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it's always kind of been divided where let's say half the country wants to really be Russian or, or, or be part of the Russian con confederation or whatever you want to call it. And then the other half wants to stand alone. Is that kind of accurate? And maybe half likes Russia, half hates Russia. Would that be accurate? Yes. This, what you described, was very much true until two years ago. If you look at the electoral results in Ukraine ever since it became an independent state in 1991, you will see that there have, they have been alternating the, uh, the presidency. Uh, they have a system a bit like the American one, so the president is the most important figure. The presidency has been alternating between the pro-Russians and the anti-Russians. That means, uh, because we don't have much, uh, we don't have any doubt that they were more or less fair, the elections, that means that there were parts of the electorate that at some point they wanted to to support the pro-Russian, and uh, a few years down the line, they would support the anti-Russian candidate. And of course, there was a 30-40% on either side who would not budge, and they were the decided pro-Russians and anti-Russians. Yeah. Now, I said this was the case until two years ago. The reason why I say that is because there's no better way than to unite a divided nation or a team or a household or any kind of group of people than to attack them externally. Absolutely. Let me make two comments because that is, that is fascinating and I did not know that. So you're saying for really 30, 40 more years up until let's say two years ago, it, it kind of was like a, a ping pong ball. They would bat it back and forth. One presidency would be pro-Russian. One presidency would be anti-Russian, something like that, back and forth. You know, my, my dad used to always tell me he, uh, when it comes to the politics in the United States, he'd say Democrats and Republicans are two heads of the same snake. And it almost seems like that analogy applies up until two years ago and, and, I, I've made this comment before. I think that took place in the United States. I think it went Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat until Trump. I do think Trump was the guy in 2016, and we don't have to get into him, but I think he was the guy that kind of was like a little bit breaking that back and forth mold and maybe breaking the two heads uh, of the same snake. The other point you just made, which I think is an amazing point, is there is no better way to unite a divided country than being attacked and going to war. And I think we have two amazing examples of that. You know, what took place in 2001 with 9-11 and the attacks on the World Trade Centers, there's a perfect example. Everybody at that time hated George W. Bush. And now all of a sudden, you know, we're all rallied around George W. Bush. And then I would argue the same thing happened more recently in Gaza, 
in Israel. You know, the October 7th attack really kind of squashed what was the uprising against the Netanyahu administration with the judicial reforms that were taking place and the division that seemed to be happening in Israel. All of a sudden, October 7th happens, boom, those protests go away, all of that goes away, and you've got a united front against, you know, a bigger enemy, so to speak. So anyway, very, very interesting point. Exactly the case as it is. So that was the situation until two years ago. There was always an independent Ukraine in the 32 years that it was, almost 30 years, a bit more, that it was independent after the Soviet Union. There was always these two poles, the pro-Russians and the anti-Russian. What will surprise you a lot, Ray, is that Zelensky, the current president, the new Churchill as celebrated by some in the West and in Ukraine, actually came to power, was voted in by promising to the electorate that he was going to fix the relationship with Russia, which was broken. And that he will, and let us not forget that the chap is in fact a Russian speaker. His mother tongue is Russian. Wow. He speaks Ukrainian as a second language. That's amazing. And that's something nobody knows here. That's very interesting. So he ran under the platform of hey I'm going to I'm going to repair this relationship and I'm going to unite it. You know where did that guy even come from? Because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of videos on the internet of him that he was like an actor or a dancer or you know not someone that came up through politics. I don't know if you want to get into that now or if you want me to write it down and we can we can visit it a little later but I mean really quick what, what do you think of him? Actually, I I think that he he has shown himself to be a man of charisma, incredible resilience, and of and authoritative. And I have to say, I do have some admiration for him. He was certainly not the kind of joker that many thought, dismissing him easily. Oh well, a former comedian. Uh, it was. Frankly, the way that his candidacy was uh, actually was started is that he was a comedian and uh, being uh, the main uh, hero of a comedy, a sitcom, which was called The Servant of the People. And, and where he was playing the president of the Ukraine. Amazing was fighting against constant corruption and the bureaucracy of the Ukrainian system. And that, in and the most amazing situation of real life imitating art this time, is what happened. In fact, his party, called Servants of the People, was inaugurated by his studio channel. They started a party. And that man, that man, in the second round of the elections, won by 73% against the current incumbent presidents. That's amazing. So so literally, he was the lead comedian actor in a show that ended up becoming reality. That's amazing. Yes. Wow, that is amazing. All right, let me let me t- and and again if if you're ready for this, you know, one thing that that I wanted to ask you about was the the Rand report. And again, the Rand report is something nobody in the United States, I guarantee you nobody listening and quite frankly probably a handful of people even understand or know about. So, would you mind explaining that to us? Of course. It's what I'm going to say will sound very controversial, but the Rand Institute, to their credit, and I, we must mention that, have not removed it. It's still on their website, publicly accessible by everyone, and it is called uh, Extending Russia, that report, the infamous one, 
of from 2019. So quite a while before any talk of war between the West and Russia. Now, it includes about several dozen, about 50, if I remember, ways that the United States could act against Russia so that it could curtail Russia's influence throughout the world, destabilize it, and cause problems for Russia. So strategic power again, nothing uh, wrong with that, and it happens all the time. One of the 50 is cause a war between Russia and Ukraine, or if I remember correctly, give a pretext to Russia to invade Ukraine. And this is one of the 50 reasons, one of the 50 ways that Russia could be destabilized and lose influence in the war. Yeah, so the RAND report is literally a document that is public, accessible, and it talks about 50 ways to weaken Russia and to destabilize Russia. And one of those ways you're saying is to get it into a war with Ukraine. In, and in order to provoke Russia, I'm going to take a wild guess, would that be provoking them by having Ukraine join NATO? It does mention NATO um, expansion, but it is primarily uh, directed to what the US uh, as such would do, not at NATO. It doesn't mention NATO uh, expansion to Ukraine. It just mentions that let's have a war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and this is going to be to our advantage. Now, let's, uh, let's see it in context, this expansion of NATO that caused so much grief in the end, what started uh, was publicly proclaimed in 2008, it was in 2008 uh, that uh, NATO, in all its wisdom, decided that uh, Ukraine and Georgia were going to become members of NATO, and the doors were open for them. I believe this was the initial kick that led the ball rolling into the wall, 2008, if you want to follow okay. that. Okay, okay. That, and in 2008, was that when Viktor Yanukovych was elected the president of Ukraine, or did he come after that? Uh, Yanukovych was elected, I think uh, it was, no, it was not Yanukovych in power in 2008. He came in power later, and, of course, he was removed in 2014 by the Democratic Revolution, which, uh, of course, uh, for which the Russians remain convinced, and others, not only the Russians, that it was in orchestrated and uh, assisted by the United States. Because, of course, what we had was... Uh, the elected president, who was removed by massive demonstrations, which then turns ugly and violent at some point. So he could not really plausibly remain any longer, and he actually took refuge to Moscow. So You're talking about Yanukovych, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, so so you know, I've we've talked we talked about this a little before we got on the air, but you know, two guys that I've I've learned a lot from are Jeffrey Sachs and John Mearsheimer. And those two guys, you know, they always talk about how Yanukovych was, you know, democratically elected. He wanted to basically play the role of Switzerland almost. Uh, I'm being, I'm using an analogy. He didn't want to be pro-Russian. He didn't want to be pro-American, pro-NATO. He said, hey, 
just leave us alone. We're going to be in the middle. We're not taking sides. Just let us let us basically, you know, go about our lives. And then from there, that did not seem to be the answer the United States wanted. And based on what you said in terms of 2008, this ball started rolling about having Ukraine and Georgia join NATO. That's when it does seem that the United States backed a, I don't know if you want to call it a coup or some type of demonstration to basically then remove Yanukovych, who was just democratically elected. Did I did I sum that up accurately? Yes, this is exactly how Russians and some other pundits see it. And uh, the two uh, very, uh, the two great luminaries that you mentioned as well, this is how they interpret it. I tend to share their view uh, by, although I would describe uh, Yanukovych more pro Russian rather than completely seen as completely neutral. In the sense that he wanted to have uh, a, what, I'll give you an example for that, practical example. The reason why these demonstrations started in 2014 was that uh, the president refused to validate an agreement between uh, the European Union and Ukraine, which would have been a significant step towards eventual membership. Got it. Got it. Okay. A partnership and cooperation agreement, much closer. And he said, well, if we do that, obviously the Russians will, will be displeased. And so I'm not going to sign it in order to be this kind of Switzerland that you mentioned before. And of course, there was a large part of the population that wanted this because they were hoping that Ukraine was going to become part of the EU and NATO, of which we will talk about uh, afterwards. And I'm not saying that the United States started the negotiations or the coup, no. But as, as happens usually in such situations, when there is an internal change of events that actually suits you extremely well, you... You help support it. That doesn't mean that you have caused it. Absolutely. It's plausible that you help support it. That makes a lot of sense. And is that when, you know, Crimea became part of the controversy? Because that's another, that's another, that's another thing most people don't understand in terms of, you know, the, the situation in Crimea really starting in 2014. Is that part of that as well? Yes, it took 2014 was the annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation. Mind you, this was the most bloodless coup of arms ever since Hitler managed to reunite Austria with uh, the German Reich in 1938 in the so-called Anschluss. Not a shot was fired. Not a shot was fired when... The, when Crimea was taken over by Russian forces. There are reasons for that. First of all, it happened, it took place not by an actual invasion, but through infiltration, the little green men, as they mm. were fancily called by the media. Number two, the big majority, the, the, the a significant majority of Crimeans were very happy to be parts of Russia, and they had had enough of being part of Ukraine. And the third was that uh, Ukraine was in no state to resist at all at that time. Got it. Got it. Okay. So the so so the fo the the folks living in Crimea they were part of the contingency of Ukrainians that really did identify to an extent as Russians. And so what you're saying is that that Crimea annexation which a lot of a lot of americans think was like again the beginning of putin putting using an iron fist it wasn't that it's like the crimeans wanted to be part of russia anyway so it was it was it, it, it was not what what many think was the case okay that is 
Listen, listen to this, Ray. Yeah. When uh, Ukraine proclaimed independence after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the uh, Crimea had, at the time, uh, within the internal Soviet Socialist Republic, it had a, some a kind of independent parliament, representatives. It had elected representatives. It was a semi-autonomous region of Ukraine. These elected representatives came together the, the week after Ukrainian independence, and they voted uh, against joining Ukraine in its independence, but and voted to become part of Russia. Wow. And that is why I believe that Crimea has a very special status in our discussion. It is not the same like the rest of Ukraine. Okay, okay, very interesting. Okay, fundamentally, I mean, is this a civil war? Is it a revenge war? Is it an East versus West war? Is it a land grab? I mean, what what is this war that started in March of 2022? Well, let's take uh, some of these options and discuss them briefly. Land grab, it is not. And uh, they, the Russians, the Russians have the largest land mass on Earth. It actually spans through 11 time zones, believe it or not. That's amazing. And uh, the whole of Russia... It is 28 times larger than the whole of Ukraine. And Ukraine is pretty big. It's after Russia, the second largest parts of the country in Europe. Still, Russia is 28 times larger. So land grab, no. That's, it's not that they were in need for any land. Expanding influence, yes. This I can understand. But the war... And this is evident by how it played out at the beginning and until now. The war is, uh, was perceived that it was going to be a blitzkrieg of sorts, which would completely destroy the power structure and decapitate the regime. And after a couple of weeks, the Russians would go home and allow the new puppet regime or Moscow-motivated regime to stay in place. They never had any intention of get of taking over. Uh, sorry, taking over any part of Ukraine. That is why they also attacked at the very beginning with insufficient powers. We will go into that a bit later. I want to answer some of your other. Uh, points, options that you gave in your question. Whether it is a revenge war, I would not call it a revenge war. You, you can find certain elements that created a, a feeling of a feel, bad blood between the Russians and Ukrainians, and I mentioned that previously, but it was not that anything so bad had happened that they, the Russians wanted to take revenge on the Ukrainians or vice versa. A civil war was how it was mostly perceived by both Ukrainians and Russians. If you go and visit Ukraine and Russia and make friends, you will see that there is a vast number, millions, of Ukrainians living in Russia. Uh, some of the, uh, many of your Russian friends will tell you, oh, you know, I'm half Ukrainian because my mother met my father who was Ukrainian back in Kiev when we were all one single country, and which was until 91. And so I'm half Ukrainian. I'm quarter Ukrainian. The same in Ukraine, you receive people who are either 100% Russian or they are half Russian. So there has been an admixture to, to such an extent that some analysts uh, have 
described it, the Ukrainian nationality as something that was, if not pulled out of a hat, but certainly something that had been at a low level priority in the consciousness of many Ukrainians, particularly in the East. In the West, as we explained, there was always a different mentality. They saw the Wehrmacht as their saviors. They fought against the Soviets. So that's it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. So civil war describes it very accurately. It's a fratricidal struggle. And this has, is what has, on one hand, discomfited the Russians that I have spoken to the most, and also why it has made Ukrainians, even pro-Russian Ukrainians, completely enraged that their brother nation would actually attack them and try to destroy them. Mm. If it was their sworn enemy of the last 500 years, then perhaps you would understand it. But the fact that it is your brother who is attacking you, that makes it far worse. Okay, okay. Let's talk about that for a second. And I'm going to try to try to describe this, and you correct me if I'm wrong, because, again, another, another issue with us in the United States is we don't understand the geography of this at all. So as you said before, Russia's massive. Russia's 28 times larger than Ukraine, but Ukraine is massive. Like I think if you dropped Ukraine in the middle of the United States, Ukraine would probably take up maybe maybe a third or a quarter of the United States, right? I don't well, I guess. Okay, quarter of the United States. So it's pretty damn big. And so for people to understand, imagine three quarters of the United States and then starting in, I don't know, Arizona, Nevada, that's Ukraine. So it's attached to, let's say, the bottom left of the bottom bottom left of Russia. And then all along the rest of the Russian border on the left side, you've got countries that are now part of NATO. And we're going to get into NATO in a second. So the question becomes, you know, it, is, is it plausible that part of what is happening with this war is Ukraine is Russia's red line in terms of joining NATO? And when things finally were talked about Russia joining NATO, or I'm sorry, Ukraine joining NATO, that's when Russia said, you know what, that's our red line. You've already brought on Finland and I think Norway and other countries that are basically, it's almost like we're engulfing Russia, at least on the one border with NATO countries. And then the biggest country would be Ukraine and Russia did not want that. Was, was that relatively accurate? Yes, it's very accurate. And let us face it, and I would like your viewers and listeners to be aware, that notwithstanding what we are being fed as propaganda by, the, by leaders in the West, it was the expansion of NATO that was the biggest proximal cause of what happened in 19, uh, sorry, in 2022. Okay. NATO had, had already started expanding and it took over the uh, most countries, all countries essentially, of Central and Eastern Europe in various stages. And the Russians were seeing it with alarm but of course, they knew that the, on one hand, they had, they had become very weak after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it was essentially forced down their throats. And on the other hand, they, they realized that uh, it, they, there was no way that they could control these countries, which were completely foreign to them. Hungary, Poland and uh, control them and be able to make them stop, uh, to stop them from joining yeah, NATO. Yeah. It started becoming very close to the bone when uh, 
not only Warsaw Pact countries. Remember the Warsaw Pact? A little bit, yeah. I mean, you can, if you want to give us a quick refresher, that'd be amazing. Okay, I will do that. The Warsaw Pact was the other side against which the Third World War would have been fought if it had happened during the Third World, during the Cold War. The Warsaw Pact essentially uh, comprised of the Soviet Union and all its buffer states that have in the meantime joined Western Europe. So that would be Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Eastern Germany, let's not forget. Now, the Warsaw Pact dissolved itself in 1991. Okay. It was like later a defensive treaty. Got it. Got it. Okay. This is awesome. This is awesome because this leads exactly to where I want to go. So the Warsaw Pact was between Russia and Hungary and Poland and all these countries. It was a defensive treaty. NATO technically was a defensive treaty. The Warsaw Pact dissolved in 1991 when really the fall of the USSR happened. So they're like, okay, well, no more USSR. We don't need this. NATO should have should have been disbanded as well. Because from my understanding, NATO was created against the USSR. So in 1991, when the USSR basically is, is broken apart, there's really fundamentally no need for NATO anymore. That's absolutely true. So at that time, at the beginning of the 90s, NATO had to reinvent itself and find a completely new uh, way of approaching uh, international security and current affairs. So it became a bit of a security umbrella in general, but it also uh, continued providing full security, uh, full defense coverage to all its members. And of course, the Russians, all Russians that I've spoken to, they were expecting that the same way that the Warsaw Pact was self-dissolved self -dissolved in 91, that NATO would also go down that path. They were very disillusioned that this did not happen, because, let's face it, it was uh, for them, for the Russians, the Soviets, NATO was perennially the enemy that they were going to fight against. And suddenly they have lost the Cold War, their, their country has been dissolved, and their alliance has been dissolved, the Warsaw Pact. So you can imagine the feeling of humiliation that the Russians had to go through. So NATO, of course, didn't dissolve. And we know, and there has been a lot written about this, so I suggest we do not really cover this at any length, but anyone can find thousands of pages written about this particular uh, point that I'm going to mention. There were verbal assurances given to Mikhail Gorbachev and uh, Yeltsin afterwards that there was not, there was no question of NATO moving closer to what was then the Soviet and swiftly became the Russian border. Even Eastern Germany, even though Germany was going to be unified, Eastern Germany would not be a NATO staging ground within the unified Germany. For some obscure and to most of us unknown game of history, the Russians did not insist to have this in writing. So these were only verbal promises. We know that this was the case because it's not just the say-so of the Russians, but with this, the say-so of a number of Westerners who were around and they say, yes, we promised that, not in writing, to the Russians. So obviously they felt not only threatened, but they also uh, and disillusioned, but deceived as well. Because this, is, this was something that it was promised to them, and we never did. And in fact, 
NATO didn't, NATO didn't seem to stop anywhere. It went on and on and on, taking the three Baltic countries, taking not only all Warsaw Pact countries, Romania was also was one that we forgot in the listing before. But it took in at some at the end of its expansion towards the east, three countries that were actually part of the Soviet Union itself, the three Baltic countries. Mm. Which ones are those? Latvia? Latvia, Lithuania, and, and Estonia. And Estonia. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, you know what? You're totally right, and I have read so much about that exact same thing. Promises were made <clears throat> to Gorbachev. Promises were made to Boris Yeltsin. And basically, all of those promises were, <clears throat> were reneged on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to sum that, to summarize all that, fundamentally... The Warsaw Pact got disbanded. Russia pretty, or USSR at the time, pretty much kind of was broken apart. And then hindsight shows us that NATO got, NATO doubled down, tripled down. It's gotten stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger. And that tells you something right there. It really does. That tells you something right there that instead of, I guess, calming the flames we really threw gas on the fire and have expanded NATO and continue to expand NATO. And in many ways, that is what is causing the tension with Russia. So, okay, let's, let's take us back to this because this is, this is one thing I've always been curious about, the fall of the USSR. And by the way, at that time, I mean, I remember growing up and there were two superpowers. It was the United States and it was, you know, what we called the USSR. I don't really remember. I mean, we call them the Soviets. I don't really remember calling them the Russian Federation. I think that came after. No, no, the Russian Federation was part of the USSR. Okay, the Russian Federation was part of the USSR. Okay, so what the heck happened? Like, how did, or why did... I don't know if it was Gorbachev or Yeltsin. Why did they agree to disband the USSR? Did they realize, okay, hey, we're just not strong enough anymore? Or like, why did they even do that? Mikhail Gorbachev, however much he is lauded and applauded in the West, is a is someone that is despised in Russia because it destroyed the Soviet Union. He managed to destroy it. Now, we have to understand that this would, he was not bent on doing this. If anything, he wanted to reform the USSR, which had become too bureaucratic. It was lagging behind in most economic indices, but it could have gone on for several more decades as things happened. What his mistake was, is that in trying to reform, he actually took off all the, the rails that were carrying things and every kind of safeguards that the Soviet state system had. And the whole system suddenly collapsed and collapsed completely. First, what happened was the fall of the Berlin Wall. You remember this? Yeah, I do remember and, that. And the fall of the Berlin Wall eventually led to, a, within a couple of years, to the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, and then the dissolution by treaty of uh, the U USSR and the creation of the independent nations that followed it. So yes, it is absolutely true that this was the case. Going back to what was happening in West and East Berlin at the time, how if we want to find one word of why this happened, it was a com an accidental explosion. If you want. wow. Interesting. Okay. And that is interesting that, that Gorbachev 
is, let's say, praised in the Western side, but despised by the 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 the, the, the former Soviets or the Russians. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. All right, let's talk about the rise of Putin. Like, when did he get into the mix, and when did he really start to, you know, gain power, <clears throat> gain power and notoriety? And then I just want your overall views on him. What you think of him? Putin was uh, a was part of the inner circle of Boris Yeltsin, and. Interestingly, he was perceived as someone rather pliable and not harboring any personal uh, delusions of power. And so initially he became for a while the head of the security services, the first bear, the successor to the KGB. And in 1999, he became prime minister. And as prime minister, he ran for the presidential elections in Russia in 2000, and he was duly elected. So what he did was, on one hand, he, he reinstated law and order, which had completely been lost during the 90s. Uh, it was... Uh, I'm sure you may have heard about the Wild East, and that was Russia during the 90s. So he brought back a functioning state, mm -hmm. a reliable civil service, and most importantly, a, a situation whereby most citizens felt at ease and uh, in safety. He also uh, had, he buoyed by very high, uh, very high oil prices after 2002, when they started going up. He was seen as being, helping the economy, which had completely run aground again during the 1990s. And he finally started... Uh, pushing a little bit more of Russia's weight around internationally, which was not the case in the 1990s. Under okay. And let's not forget, we have a huge nation, a proud nation, the Russians, who have, uh, as we have said before, they feel uh, cheated, disillusioned, and defeated, and deceived. Yeah, and you know what? I, I I think this is something that we probably should at least spend a, a minute on. Is aside from all the political stuff, fundamentally, I mean, the Russian people are absolutely a proud and you know I don't want to say they have an ego because that sounds negative. It's more that they have pride, real pride in being Russian. And I think a lot of times that seems to be underestimated. And the Western media makes us in the United States think it's all Putin, Putin, Putin. It's not just Putin. It's really the entire, I would say, oligarch class in Russia and the entire, you know, all of the people of substance, they're proud people. And and I totally do think that when the USSR fell, you know, that's a that's a blow to the ego. That's a blow to the ego. And when you're a proud culture and you've got history and you've got traditions and you've got things that you really believe in, you know, those those matter and those really will or not will. I feel like they're a part of, you know the ongoing situation, right? Like, it's it's a really proud culture. Imagine if you're a nation that constantly sets red lines and they are being crossed by your erstwhile opponent, enemy. In, uh, I, the first shock to the Russians was the bombing of Serbia in 1999, which uh, was done by NATO. There was no UN confirmation 
of that. So it was done as part of NATO with the United States, essentially. And, and, and that's, that's when we bombed Serbia to create Kosovo in order to have a military base there, basically. Sorry, can you repeat that? Because you, you were lost. You broke up. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I said, Serbia, that was when we bombed Serbia, created Kosovo, and then basically established a NATO military base in Kosovo. Exactly. This is it. And let's not... That is crazy. And you know what? I want to actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a separate podcast episode with you on that, because I think that is... That is such a cautionary tale, and not only cautionary, it's such a misunderstood situation that if people had that as a background, honestly, probably everything that's happened since would make a lot more sense. So can I, can I, can I, can I hold you to bringing you back on to do a specific episode on that? I, I would be happy to. All right. That's fantastic. OK, so you were saying about Putin, you know, you're basically well, what I'm really trying to just help people understand is, you know, just what you really think about this guy. We talked about Zelensky. And, and to be honest with you, I was a little bit I was I, I learned something from you and I was a little bit surprised that maybe, you know, you have the respect and admiration for his resilience and all that, because, again, I, I did not prior to hearing that from you. I thought this guy was just someone that was planted to basically play a role, which ironically, it seems like he did. So, so anyway, that's good learning for me on Zelensky. But, but give, us, give us the rest of your thought process on Putin. Well, Putin, first of all, what is the most outrageous piece of information for uh, your viewers and listeners is that he has been genuinely... Uh, been, uh, he has had generally the support of the Russians uh, to up to extents that U.S. presidents I don't have never had. We're talking about real seventy percent plus wow. approval rates, and this has been the case ever since he came to power in the year two thousand. That's so, that's amazing. So, like, if I if I go to Russia and I talk to a hundred random people on the street, what you're saying is seventy, at maybe at least seventy of those random one hundred people will love Putin and they will support him. Yeah, and they are supporting him. Definitely. Okay, that's incredible. That's incredible. Let's. Let's assume that they are telling the truth and they are not afraid. But don't forget, let's not forget that they actually know, because I have friends, personal friends, for a very long time, and I know when they are telling me the truth or not, they know that I'm safe with the secrets. So, yes, a genuine 70 75%. I believe his approval rate currently, uh, I mean, a few in the last month, was 86%. And you know, I mean, that is incredible. Yeah. That is incredible. And and that's information we've never even remotely will get told that Putin's approval rating is 86%. You know, I've always I've always wanted to understand, yeah, what the Russian people think of him. So I appreciate I appreciate you sharing that. That that's amazing, man. And that's that is why it is so wrong and methodologically unsound and politically silly to actually claim that all this was a one man's war. There's much more to it than that. I'm not saying that if uh, it had not been for Putin, there would, uh, there would also have been a war right at that time. But in reality, you would be, as things have turned out, you will see that there is much more support for this war than we are made to believe from our, uh, from our own media here in the West. No, absolutely. It was it was soundbite after soundbite. Putin's Putin's brutal invasion. 
Putin's brutal invasion. Like it was just that that seemed like that was the marketing slogan that was given to all Western leaders. And they were required to say that six times in every every interview. You know, it's funny when you start to when you start to really again, rise above and look at everything from 30,000 feet and separate your emotions a little bit, you really start seeing narratives and you start seeing the manipulation that can happen when a concentrated group of media gets behind a narrative because they all say the same thing. And quite frankly, it's impossible for all these humans to be saying the same thing unless they're being told to say that same thing. So the propaganda, I mean, it's incredible. All right. So let me ask you this because man, I feel like we could go on for hours and hours and hours, which would be amazing. Fundamentally, I mean, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think it, what do you think is next for the Russia Ukraine situation? Very good question. I am not uh, a prophet, but I have made some sound predictions in the past on this and I will try to uh, to muster some of my knowledge and experience on this it seems that we are stuck right now as we speak in the middle of 2024 we are stuck in a bit of a forever war this may may change at the end of the year with the American elections, depending on who wins them. Uh, but I, uh, the, the West and the European Union and NATO have put so much effort and ideological capital into this war against Russia and Putin that now it would be very difficult, perhaps almost impossible, for them to back up, to back off and say, sorry, we were right, let's have peace now with Russia. Mm -hmm. Because after all this propaganda that has been served from the Russians, right side to the Russians, from our side, the West, to us, it's extremely difficult now when we have been saying, oh yes, until the very end, yes, we will fight until the, Rus the last Russian soldier leaves Crimea and Ukraine. NATO is going to, uh, to, to have Ukraine with open arms and all these things. And we are going to give them all, these, all this money. You mentioned before about the U.S., um, having paid $173 billion. I made a back-of-the-envelope calculation, and I, the direct cost of this war is 700 billion euros so far. That is the cost to the West only. I mean, the... Um, grosso modo belligerence. It does not take into consideration what the Ukrainians and the Russians have suffered. So it's only the support that we have been given, we have been giving to Ukraine, and also the, the damage that has been created to us, the Europeans, for from having much more expensive energy for for the the price of foodstuffs going through the roof and all that that made it seven hundred yeah. billion. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. Wow, that is amazing. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned forever wars because I've talked about that a lot on the podcast, the concept of forever wars, the biggest one being Afghanistan. You know, it's like 20, 20 years, trillions of dollars, millions of deaths. And what happens in 2021? We give it right back to the Taliban. Like that stuff just doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. All right, listen, I want to do this because this is fantastic, and I also know that it is such a complex 
overall issue. What I'd love to do is we're going to kind of end this here. And there's two things I'm going to ask of you. One is I absolutely want to do a separate episode on Serbia and Kosovo because I think that that deserves its, you know, its own episode in its own time. And then secondly, I know there's going to be a million questions that people have coming out of this session. So maybe we can even do a follow up, a follow up on this and then answer people's questions and then dig into anything else. Is there anything else you wanted to kind of leave us with and any, any, any parting thoughts or things you'd like us to really keep our mind open to? The best way for listeners and viewers to actually access some even-handed information is not Russian websites or some or Ukrainian. Uh, I would suggest that they try outlets from India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, South Africa, and Brazil. English speaking. Oh wow! Okay, great. That's great advice. Especially the first countries, as part of the British Empire and influence, they have a lot of. Uh, English speaking media. And that would also give them not only a more even handed approach to the war, but something much more important, which we can uh, we can have as a parting shot for now, that the majority of the world's population, not the majority of the world's countries, the majority of the world's population, support Russia against NATO. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right, that is a that is a fantastic way to end and I've I've been waiting to be able to use this expression and you're finally allowing me to use it but you are a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> <laughs> and a scholar. All right, listen, Professor, we really appreciate it. I think this was fantastic. Again, I want everybody to be able to digest what we've talked about. I think more than anything, people realize, one, this did not start in March of 2022. Two, there's much more to this overall than simply it being you know, Putin's brutal invasion, which was the buzzword and the marketing phrase that we got fed over and over and over again. And we'll probably get fed that more. So this is a fantastic start. I appreciate your time. And I am looking forward to bringing you back to talk Serbia, Kosovo, and then to really almost do a part two on this and get into anything we didn't discuss. I would be delighted. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Take care. The ending was terrific. This episode was brought to you by the new book, Deep Shallow Dive Into You, available now on Amazon and Barnes & Noble in hardcover and paperback. Don't forget to sign up for our new mailing list on our website at deepshallowdive.com.